I live in the angle of a leaden wall, into whose composition was poured a little alloy of bell metal. Often in the repose of my midday, there reaches my ears a confused tintinabulum from without. It is the noise of my contemporaries. My neighbors tell me of their adventures with famous gentlemen and ladies, what notabilities they met at the dinner table. But I am no more interested in such things than in the content of the Daily Times. The interest and the conversation are about costume and manners, chiefly. But a goose is a goose still. Dress it as you will. They tell me of California and Texas, of England and the Indies, of the Honorable Mr. Blank, of Georgia or of Massachusetts. All transient and fleeting phenomena till I am ready to leap from their courtyard like the Mameluke Bay. I delight to come to my bearings, not walk in procession with pomp and parade in a conspicuous place, but to walk even with the builder of the universe, if I may. Not to live in this restless, nervous, bustling, trivial 19th century, but stand or sit thoughtfully while it goes by. What are men celebrating? They are all on a committee of arrangements and hourly expect a speech from somebody. God is only the president of the day and Webster is his orator. I love to weigh, to settle, to gravitate toward that which most strongly and rightfully attracts me. Not hang by the beam of the scale and try to weigh less. Not suppose a case, but take the case that is to travel the only path I can, and that on which no power can resist me. It affords me no satisfaction to commerce, to spring an arch before I have got a solid foundation. Let us not play at kitly vendors. There is a solid bottom everywhere. We read that the traveler asked the boy if the swamp before him had a hard bottom. The boy replied that it had, but presently the traveler's horse sank in up to the girths, and he observed to the boy, I thought you said this bog had a hard bottom. So it has, answered the latter but you've not got halfway to it yet. So it is with the bogs and quicksands of society. But he is an old boy that knows it. Only what is thought, said or done, at a certain rare coincidence, is good. I would not be one of those who will foolishly drive a nail into mere lathe and plastering. Such a deed would keep me awake nights. Give me a hammer, and let me feel for the furring. Do not depend on the putty. Drive a nail home, and clinch it so faithfully that you can wake up in the night and think of your work with satisfaction a work at which you would not be ashamed to invoke the muse. So will help you, God. And so only. Every nail driven should be as another rivet, 
in the machine of the universe. You carrying on the work. Rather than love, than money, than fame. Give me truth. I sat at a table where rich food and wine in abundance and obsequious attendance, but sincerity and truth were not, and I went away hungry from the inhospitable board. The hospitality was as cold as the ices. I thought that there was no need of ice to freeze them. They talked to me of the age, of the wine, and the fame of the vintage. But I thought of an older, a newer, and purer wine. Of a more glorious vintage, which they had not got, and could not buy. The style, the house and grounds, and entertainment pass for nothing with me. I called on the king, but he made me wait in his hall and conducted like a man incapacitated for hospitality. There was a man in my neighborhood who lived in a hollow tree. His manners were truly regal. I should have done better had I called on him. How long shall we sit in our porticos, practicing idle and musty virtues, which any work would make impertinent? As if one were to begin the day with long suffering, and hire a man to hoe his potatoes, and in the afternoon go forth to practice Christian meekness and charity with goodness aforethought. Consider the China, pride, and stagnant self-complacency of mankind. This generation inclines a little to congratulate itself on being the last of an illustrious line. And in Boston, and London, and Paris, and Rome, thinking of its long descent it speaks of its progress in art and science and literature with satisfaction. There are the records of the philosophical societies and the public eulogies of great men. It is the good Adam contemplating his own virtue. Yes, we have done great deeds and sung divine songs which shall never die. That is, as long as we can remember them. The learned societies and great men of Assyria, where are they? What youthful philosophers and experimentalists we are. There is not one of my readers who has yet lived a whole human life. These may be but the spring months in the life of the race. If we have had the seven years itch, we have not seen the seventeen-year locust yet in Concord. We are acquainted with a mere pellicle of the globe on which we live. Most have not delved six feet beneath the surface, nor leaped as many above it, we know not where we are. Beside, we are sound asleep nearly half our time. Yet we esteem ourselves wise and have an established order on the surface. Truly, we are deep thinkers. We are ambitious spirits. As I stand over the insect crawling amid the pine needles on the forest floor and endeavoring to conceal itself from my sight and ask myself 
why it will cherish those humble thoughts, and bide its head from me who might perhaps be its benefactor, and impart to its race some cheering information. I am reminded of the greater benefactor and intelligence that stands over me, the human insect. There is an incessant influx of novelty into the world, and yet we tolerate incredible dullness. I need only suggest what kind of sermons are still listened to in the most enlightened countries. There are such words as joy and sorrow, but they are only the burden of a psalm, sung with a nasal twang while we believe in the ordinary and mean. We think that we can change our clothes only. It is said that the British Empire is very large and respectable, and the United States are a first-rate power. We do not believe that a tide rises and falls behind every man which can float the British Empire like a chip, if he should ever harbor it in his mind. Who knows what sort of seventeen-year locust will next come out of the ground. The government of the world I live in was not framed like that of Britain in after-dinner conversations over the wine. The life in us is like the water in the river. It may rise this year higher than man has ever known it, and flood the parched uplands. Even this may be the eventful year which will drown out all our muskrats. It was not always dry land where we dwell. I see far inland the banks which the stream anciently washed before science began to record its freshets. Everyone has heard the story which has gone the rounds of New England of a strong and beautiful bug which came out of the dry leaf of an old table of apple tree wood which had stood in a farmer's kitchen for sixty years first in Connecticut and afterward in Massachusetts, from an egg deposited in the living tree many years earlier still, as appeared by counting the annual layers beyond it, which was heard gnawing out for several weeks, hatched perchance by the heat of an urn. Who does not feel his faith in a resurrection and immortality strengthened by hearing of this. Who knows what beautiful and winged life, whose egg has been buried for ages under many concentric layers of woodenness in the dead, dry life of society, deposited at first in the alburnum of the green and living tree, which has been gradually converted into the semblance of its well-seasoned tomb, heard perchance gnawing out now for years by the astonished family of man as they sat round the festive board may unexpectedly come forth from amidst society's most trivial and hand-celled furniture to enjoy its perfect summer life at last. I do not say that John or Jonathan will realize all this, but such is the character of that morrow which mere lapse of time can never make to dawn. 
the light which puts out our eyes is darkness to us. Only that day dawns to which we are awake. There is more day to dawn. The sun is but a morning star.